America's cable news devotees awoke this morning to a story that cable news networks would store away for lean times if we could. I'm speaking, of course, of the mesmerizing images of a 44-year-old 66-inch water main break in the Washington, D.C. suburb of, Beth of Bethesda, Maryland today. So much water. Thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of it, all icy cold, gushing downhill on ironically named River Road. Authorities sent helicopters and boats to rescue stranded motorists caught in the middle of it. Once you start watching, it's kind of hard to turn away from those images. This is a visually compelling story. After well more than an hour of compelling dramatic pictures from Bethesda, there were no injuries to report, which is great news. And while we're on the subject of compelling visuals, did you see this video from yesterday? This is Tennessee, look at this, where a 1960s era dam holding back a retention pond at a coal-fired power plant gave way, releasing a mix of water, ash, and mud that damaged 12 homes, reportedly put up to 400 acres of land next to the plant under four to six feet of black. The connection between these two visually compelling collapse of something stories is um, one of my favorite words that no one else thinks is a sexy political term. Infrastructure. I think it's a sexy political issue because our national infrastructure is a disaster. And sometimes the results are simply amazing pictures and a big mess. Like you'll recall the steam pipe that blew up under a New York City street last year. Remember that one? Yeah. Uh, other times, this big, huge, important national regress, having really old rotting pipes and bridges and levees and dams and electrical grids, results in more enormous human tragedy, like the devastating breach of New Orleans levees after Hurricane Katrina, like the collapse of an inter interstate bridge spanning the Mississippi River in Minneapolis last summer. Our country had a lot of infrastructure investment in the 1930s and in the 1950s. We were due for an infrastructure upgrade in about 1980. And that's when a widely beloved president proposed turning back most of the federal aid highway program and all transit programs to the states. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. That was the philosophy. No infrastructure spending for you. But you know, today, um, there is actually a little bit of good news about our American infrastructure crisis. Uh, and the good news about our infrastructure crisis is the bad news about the economy. Yeah, the country needs to create good jobs, like, oh, say, construction jobs, to, say, build and repair everything that is in dangerous disrepair. In the nick of time, on both counts, America elected a Democratic president who does not have the same ideological re resistance to government that um, Republicans do. He sees the need for infrastructure spending as an urgent one. Today, Vice President-elect Biden committed to infrastructure rebuilding as economic stimulus. We've let our infrastructure crumble for a long, long time, from water to roads to bridges, and uh, it makes sense to invest in them now. There will be no earmarks in this economic recovery plan. So what could hold the country back from this win-win-win proposition of infrastructure spending when we really need some infrastructure spending and we might have politicians who would be interested in providing it? What would hold us back from this proposition? Hello, Mr. House Minority Leader John Boehner. We saw your website this week where you are, quote, compiling a list of stimulus spending skeptics. So Congressman Boehner is going to lead Republican obstruction, excuse me, opposition to infrastructure spending by the federal government. Now, does he disagree that we need the infrastructure and the jobs? I need some talking down here. Here to talk me down now is A.B. Stoddard, associate editor and columnist at The Hill. A.B., thanks for joining us. Thank you, Rachel. Here's your chance to talk me down. You can either tell me that the Republicans aren't really going to oppose infrastructure spending a stimulus, or you can tell me that they will oppose it and they will be crushed. Well, I want to start by saying, in case you haven't noticed, Republicans are looking for an opening right now. Uh, now that mm. the Rod Blagojevich thing has slipped through their fingers, the cupboard is a little bit bare, and they're looking for something, for some traction against the momentum that Barack Obama is enjoying during this honeymoon that has begun. Um, obviously, pork is a tried-and-true old favorite, but it did not uh, give John McCain much traction when he tried it during the economic collapse um, in the waning weeks past the economic collapse of his campaign this fall. 
Um, it is something that uh, conservatives will rally behind. John Boehner is looking for some critics of the stimulus package. He's probably going to find them outside of the Congress. A consensus has emerged among economists that this is the time that where government must step in, obviously, to, to avoid a depression um, and, 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 and to put off deficit reduction. It, it is going to be very hard to convince those members who are listening to their mayors and their governors and, and their voters who are hurting and are out of jobs um, that infrastructure is not sexy. <laughs> it is going to be um, the pressure that they're going to be feeling, Republican members of Congress, is going to be uh, much more powerful at home than what they hear in their GOP conference meetings. So while there will be a good talking point the Republicans have about earmarks and how we can't let this become pork and it's going to be a disaster, but in the end, the package will pass. And I'm not saying it's going to pass within 10 days of Barack Obama becoming president, but I have a feeling Republicans will vote for it and it will pass. When we just heard Joe Biden there say that there will be no earmarks on this plan, that there will be no earmark spending in the stimulus package, presumably he's trying to head off any attempts by political opponents to caricature this as a whole bunch of bridges to nowhere, to say this is not just earmark pet projects, there is actually some solid thinking behind this. Can, can he effectively, can the administration effectively declare that there won't be earmarks? They absolutely must. Um, he is also giving, sounding a warning to his own party. This is the only train and the largest one leaving the station. It is not. It is not going to fall as a stimulus package under the normally but uh, normal sort of budgetary rules and constraints that you have in terms of pay-as-you-go rules and that kind of thing. So it normally would be larded up with pork. People will be rushing to try to 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 attach things, um, goodies everywhere. But Joe Biden and Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, and the Senate Majority. Leader Harry Reid will have to be very strict to keep this earmark free because this has to be pure stimulus or they will face you know the wrath of the voters in two years obviously the Republicans are preying on some anxiety and outrage people are feeling about the TARP program worried that it was a runaway uh, disaster and that banks can't tell us where um, and how they've used the money so th th the Democrats are under they're gonna have to really scrub this clean and make sure um, that they're that they're talking about these shovel-ready projects and that they are not pork and that they're um, projects that are going to create jobs and, and really save communities and, and not be tennis courts and dog parks. A.B. Stoddard, associate editor and columnist for The Hill, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Rachel. I'm